Good evening, everyone. If you would take your psalm books and stand, turn to page 341. Page 341. Stand as you sing the lily of the valley. Amen. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's a fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Amen. The lily of the valley. In him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort. In trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care I need to roll. Hallelujah, he's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's a very soft ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken and all my sorrow borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty care. I have all been forsaken and all my idols born of my heart and now he keeps me by his fire. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me so, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. Hallelujah! He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never Will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. He's a man I heed, my hungry soul shall fear. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever go. Hallelujah! He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's a very soft Sound like we got a special Woo! coming up. <laughs> All right, page 326. By the way, my grandson, we were just talking about this song, The Lily of the Valley. It's one of his favorites. I think because he likes to hear Brother Keith. Say, hey, hallelujah. <laughs> That's a first, amen. <laughs> Woo! All right, page 326. I love to tell the story. We need to tell the story, don't we? Amen. amen. 326. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know
can you, Brother Keith? That's the story I'm going to keep telling. It can be as old as you want, but to me, it's brand new every day. Amen. We open up our service tonight in a word of prayer, brother. Lord, I do thank you, dear God, for the blessing of this day. Thank you for the good preaching this morning. Thank you for my pastor, Lord, that's uh, got enough courage and strength in you, Lord, to stand up and preach the true word of God. Lord, I pray you continue to bless you. Help you leave Brooks Baptist Church for the cause of God, Christ. God, please help us. Help us as a church family, Lord, that we pray for him. Lord, each and every day, dear God, Lord, that you put a hedge about him and his family. Because I know the old devil tries to battle him and his family, Lord, and trying to destroy him that he wouldn't be able to lead this church. Thank you for my church family. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the love we have for one another. Lord, I pray you'd bind the old devil up, keep him away out of this place tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. You may be seated. Good evening, church. Let's see who's not here. Brother Armstrong, he's getting a call later on today. Who else is? No, I'm teasing. Uh, church, I want to thank you so much for the liberty that you grant for a man of God to stand and to preach whatever's inside this Bible. Amen. I know what I preach this morning isn't popular by any means, but when has the Word of God ever been popular? I, I don't, there's not a time that I've read of where it seems like, man, the Word of God's just really popular today. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't times where it seems like God was able to work through his people, but there's always these cycles that we go through. And I'm thankful that we have an ability to look around. And my, my point in preaching that message is for you to stop and think. Instead of doing everything like the world does, why don't we as Christians go, what does God think about that? That's all I'm asking you to think about. What, what does God think about it? And I think you'll be shocked sometimes, Brother Earl, Brother Bart, Sister Charlotte, what we'll be so shocked at is when we realize we start spending time studying, there may be at some point in time one of you comes to me and says, Brother Joe, I was studying this because I noticed that people were doing it and I wanted to see what the Word of God says. And you'll say, did you know that the Bible says this? And I'll say, I had no idea. What a blessing. The point is to drive you all back into the Word of God. I think some preachers, and I, I, I was fault for this, I used to think my preaching uh, was based on how many people were coming to the altar at the end of a service. That, that's, a, that's not the best way, I think, to judge one's preaching. I think that that's the place to start, maybe. I think the best thing to do is to find out how much of my preaching drives you all back into the Word of God. Be honest, how many of you today went home and opened up the Bible and said, I want to know more about that? And if you didn't, that's okay. But I know somebody that's not here right now, that's exactly what they did. They went home and they can't be here tonight, but they said, man, I've been in my Bible. I cannot believe that Jeremiah said something about a goddess in heaven. Did y'all know the Jews were serving a goddess in heaven? It's just, that is crazy to think about. Those are God's children out, out there serving the goddess of heaven. She ain't even there. That's what's wild about it. And I, so my, my point in bringing some of these things out is just to get you, Brooks, to stop and say, well, how does my father feel about this? That, I think that ought to be the point of what we do sometimes, Brother Tom. When the world's sitting around talking about basketball, say, that's is that where I want to be when Jesus Christ comes back talking? Uh, you got it, didn't you, Brother David? Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, that, listen, there's nothing wrong with that. And I never told you that in Jeremiah 10 that was the Christmas tree. I didn't say that's what that was. Please don't interpret what I'm saying. I never said that's what that is. I'm just asking you to stop and say, okay, God, well, how do you see all of this? Because the Israelites certainly weren't doing that when they should have been. You, under you understand what I'm trying to say? And that's the only thing I wanted to attempt this morning. And some people, I'm, I think, might have been a little upset. But listen, that's okay. I'm used to people being a little upset with certain things. But can I tell you, it amazes me. There are certain places of the Bible right now, Brother Nathan, I can open up to, and I can immediately see the disposition of people. And I haven't even preached it. I've just read what the Word of God says, and they're upset. But you know what that says? That says more about them than it does about me or the Word of God. It's true. You, you, can, you can tell by someone's disposition where they're at spiritually. You can. And I'm not saying that I picked all that up this morning. Everybody's looking around like, I hope I, hope I wasn't squirming. Isn't I? That's not what I'm saying. But my point is, church, we're, I, you, you're starting to recognize something. Three or four years ago, we were, we were one place, and the Lord's done this. He's gone, all right, Brooks, let's see if we can go here now. Isn't that a blessing? And I think the, the, the more we move forward for the cause of Christ, he's going to continue to do that. Go to Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13. Book of Deuteronomy. Amen. But I had a great time this morning, didn't you? I enjoyed preaching that. I really, really did. I think some people would avoid that and just re really try to, to steer clear of subjects like that. Church, you make it a joy and a thrill to be able to preach stuff like that. I praise the Lord for it. Deuteronomy 13, I've got a special prayer request. Uh, we've got to vote on something tonight. And I've got a letter I want to read, and then we're going to turn it over to Brother Tom. And then I'm going to preach again. Amen. Deuteronomy 13, look at verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams... And giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Verse 2. 
And the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Verse 4. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, it's a, it's a pretty crazy thing to think. God says, I, I'll send a prophet to you, let him dream some dreams, say some things, let it come to pass, and then I'm going to kill him, because he's trying to turn you all the way from me. It seems a little bit picking and choosing there, doesn't it? But the point is, you find all the way through the scriptures men that want to come along and turn Israel away from their God. It happens all the time. I can give you women that did that. Jezebel's one of them. And they all had an opportunity as to serve and do right, and they did not do right. Here's my point, church. When you look at today's society, you have, you, you, if, you're a, if you're a saved, everybody look at me. If you're a saved child of God, when you see something today, what you have to think is, is this going to turn me away from my relationship with God? And if that's the case, you've got to set it aside. Because everyone's just follow. You know what sheep do? Sheep just follow each other. And you don't think about what you're doing. You just do it. Why? Well, they're doing it. Who cares? The old saying says, if they're going to jump off a cliff, are you going to? That seems silly, but that's exactly what we do. In the ministry, I think people are, you have preachers and churches all, all alike that are just jumping off clips all over the place. They're just leaving the Word of God altogether because, well, that's what the world's doing. Who cares what the world's doing? They're always going to do what they want to do. Don't let people turn you away. I'm not scared to preach certain things to you so that you don't get turned away by the world. Ephesians chapter 4, and then I'm going to give you a special prayer request tonight. Ephesians chapter 4. Let me tell you what a preacher is supposed to do. I'm going to correct myself. I want to share with you what the Word of God says a preacher is supposed to do. Who here believes that Jesus Christ gave gifts to the church? Who believes that? Amen? Good. That's what your Bible says. Christ gave gifts to the church. And he didn't just give gifts to say, here you go. He gave gifts for a purpose. There's a reason for gifts. And Paul testifies of this in Ephesians chapter 4. Look, if you will. Let's start in verse 12. No, let's, let's start back in verse number uh, 9. Now he that ascended was, I'm sorry, now he that ascended, what is it but that he should descend first into the lower parts of the earth? That's talking about Jesus Christ going into paradise. Look here. And that he descended in the same also that ascended up far above the heavens that he might fill all things. That's Jesus Christ going into the what? The third heaven where God the Father resides. And he gave some what? And some, and some, and some, and what? Notice that it says, and some evangelists, and some apostles. But when it gets to preachers, look here, it says, and some pastors and teachers. Almost to say that one person ought to fill those two roles. So that's right. 1 Timothy chapter 3 says a man of God ought to be apt to what? Teach. That means he ought to have the ability to rightly divide the word of God and teach the word of God. So this qualification right here seems to me that, that, that when you get to this portion of scripture, look what it says again. To verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the what? That's reason number one. It's to perfect the saints of God. Number two, look what it says. For the work of the what? For the edifying of the what? Isn't that a blessing? God says, I've given you these individuals so they can help you, to perfect you. For the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. Is that you? Are you a body of Christ? You better believe you are, amen. Saved into the body of Christ, and I thank the Lord for that. That's a blessing. But the reason God gave you the pastor is to help you, church. And I'm, I'm not saying this to try to say anything other than this. Pastors, evangelists, teachers, apostles, they're all gifts. And again, you can go back to James 1.17. It all comes from God the Father above. He gives you these things. So I thank God that I can be a gift to you. The reason I preach hard things is so that you could be perfected in Christ. Amen. And the reason that when I mention hard scriptures and people start to twinge, and they, all, they already are turned off by the fact that I've just read it. I haven't even preached on it. I haven't told what I believe on it. I just read it, and they're automatically upset. Just goes to show me their demeanor inside Christ. So please, church, do me a favor. Don't be that. Do not digress to the point where if I read a subject or a passage, you go, you just don't like it. Get over it. Hey, church, grow up. 
That's what Paul said to the church at Corinthians. Grow up. I've got meats I want to give you, but you can't, you can't endure those right now because you're still sipping on milk. you got to get off the bottle. Christ is doing this. In a year from now, I hope Christ does this with Brooks. Do you all want to stay in the same place a year from today? I don't, sister. I don't either, sister. Yeah, I really don't. I don't want to be the same church in a year. For, until the last trumpet sounds, I want to keep growing for Christ. Don't you? So let's endure. Let's deal with some really, there might be some things the Lord lays on my heart to preach and teach soon that are really difficult. Just endure for the perfection of God. If I preach something that's obviously abstract and totally heretical, then you come to me and you talk to me about it. I want to know if I made a mistake, I'll correct that. But if I'm giving you sound doctrine by the grace of God, endure and let's grow in the Lord. Amen? That's where I want to be, growing in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I tell you what I'm getting ready to tell you for our prayer request, I want you to know this man was born again and he has passed through the veil. He is in glory in heaven with the Father. There's no doubt about that. Brother Willis received a phone call this afternoon just before we had lunch at his house. His father was on his way traveling from Chicago to be here in Kentucky. And in Indiana, was it? He suffered a heart attack and he died this afternoon. He's with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a blessing. And Brother Willis said, there's one way to go. That's the way I would like to go. But I know how difficult it is. His father was in between homes, and now they've got to take the temple, and they've got to transport that back to whether he's going to be buried. And I think in Chicago, is that right? So you all need to love on your brother back there. And it's, it's difficult when moms and dads die. You've only got one of those. And his father was a wonderful man, loved the Lord, used to come in here with the King James Version Bible and just enjoy every minute of the preaching. I thank the Lord for that. And there are very, thank you, Brother Keith, there are a, It's a special church. There are uh, really sad, a uh, few moms and dads that you really feel like they've, they've gone and they're with him. So uh, we're going to pray for brother, brother Willis real quick. And Brother Keith, just because you, you wanted to show so much love to your brother, will you lead us in a prayer real quick? Everybody stand to your feet and let's pray and ask God to help the family right now, if you will. <clears throat> Lord, I do pray for Brother Willis now, Lord. Lord, your daddy went on to be with you, dear God. Lord, I know it's tough, dear God. Lord, you miss We're glad, Lord. We know they're in heaven. And Lord, they, there's nothing better than that. But Lord, we still, as, as humans and, and family, we miss them. Lord, I pray be with him, dear God, and be with the family, Lord. Lord, just comfort them, dear God. And give them that peace, dear God, that passes all understanding, dear God, that only you can give Lord, I'm so thankful, dear God, that I can call Lord Brother Willis my friend, dear God. Lord, I just pray, dear God, uh, just help him, Lord, strengthen him, encourage him, and help him with other church, dear God, to love him, dear God. And Lord, and let, and let him know how much we love him, that we're praying for him, and praying for the family, dear God. Lord, I pray you'd help him with all the arrangements, dear God, and everything that's coming up, dear God. Lord, just, Lord, Lord you just take care of it, dear God. Be with him, Lord, I pray. Help him, dear God. Lord, I pray, help us to pray for him. Lord, that he's a, a tremendous man of God, and love him, Lord, and a humble man. Lord, just be with him, encourage him, strengthen him, Lord, I pray, like only you can, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. It's hard when you have moms and dads that graduate. You all be in prayer for him. I'm going to say this, Brother Willis, I'd like for you to take a church card with you and whatever gas you have to expense yourself of to get up there. Amen. We'd like to take care of that for you, brother. You get up there and help, help your family get your father's temple in the ground so God can pluck it up again one day, all right? We're going to take care of that for you. I think that's what a church ought to do, praise the Lord, and I thank, I thank the Lord for that. So, brother, we love you very much. And uh, I will tell you this, Brother Willis and I were sitting here earlier this afternoon, and I was talking to him. As I can't help myself. Every time I get around that, brother, we, just, we have a good time in the Lord. And Sister Liz is over here playing the harp, and I felt like I was just being soothed in my, in my soul. But we're sitting there talking, and he told me, he said, uh, I love this church. And I know he means, I, love, I do, you all, I love this church. There is something very special going on here. I know I said that about a year and a half ago, but I think I said that in a bit of ignorance, seeing what's happening right now. I love you all. I, am, I have grown so attached to some of you all. If you all left, I'd, I'd honestly be brokenhearted. It would really hurt me. It would affect me. I love you all that much. I hope that doesn't affect my preaching. I still want to preach hard to you sometimes, okay? But I love you all. And uh, I, know that be, I know that you all love me, and I know that you love each other. But that's really, really special, genuinely, to care about one another. Aren't you glad you have a local church we can all come to? This is fam To me, you all are closer than family. I can admit that. I really can. I have a closer relationship with you all than I do with my own family. I mean that. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I do. I love my family, 
but I love you all. I'm not trying to put my family down. You know what I'm saying, Sister Carolyn? I really do. This is what God had in mind because, because when it comes to the New Testament church, I think, I think we're getting close to what we ought to be. We've got a long way to go, but, but this, is, this is a wonderful spirit we have here. I thank God for the local church, don't you? Praise God for a church family. I want to read this letter to you from the Browns. They're missionaries to America. They were with us a few months back, but it says, Pastor Joe Weber and Brooks Baptist Church family want to uh, personally thank you for your hospitality and generosity. We were truly encouraged by your genuine care for missionaries and the work of the Lord. We are so glad to know there are like-minded churches and congregations that are a, I'm sorry, that are about the Lord's business. God bless you, and we hope to work with you all again in the near future, uh, Harry Brown and family. So praise the Lord for that. Also, uh, Brother Gary Griffith called me again and told me how much of a blessing that it was, and his congregation is just so very, very thankful for the work that we committed to. You all have no idea how encouraging that is for them, so continue to pray for them. Uh, lastly, before Brother Tom comes up and gives the final announcements and the prayer requests, I've got a, a motion of business to vote on tonight. We're going to be voting Brother Andrew Keller into the body of membership here at Brooks Baptist Church. Amen. You all excited? Amen. Me too. Let's go ahead and open up for a motion of business. Do I have a, a motion? One, two. All in favor to open up for business, raise your right hand. Here we go. All in favor to bring this brother in Christ in the body of Christ here in Elizabethtown, Kentucky at Brooks Baptist Church. Raise your hand. Amen. Hey, uh, all opposed, keep your mouth shut. Mark it down, brother. You can put that in the notes. I said that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, look here. It's your family, brother. It's a blessing, isn't it? I thank God I'm looking for a lot, a lot more young men to get attached to this local body so we can march on. I, I need, this is encouraging. I need some young men. You need some young men. Churches need young men. God needs some young men. And I praise the Lord for young men, don't you? I'm excited. He's gotten himself into a load of work, and he's ready for it. I really believe that. I said, you ready? He said, yes, sir, I am. I said, praise the Lord. I'm ready too. So we're excited, brother. I've been praying for you, and I'll continue to pray for you. Amen. What a blessing. Praise the Lord. Amen, brother. What a, what a privilege. Brother Tom, come on up and give us the announcements tonight, and we'll try to get the preaching started. Amen. Our announcements for this evening. Our next Godly Men's Discipline course is Saturday, March the 30th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Sunday, March 31st is Resurrection Sunday, along with every other Sunday. Our next Bluegrass Assisted Living Service will be Sunday, April the 7th at 1 p.m. Our next Ladies Fellowship Meeting, Saturday, April the 13th at 1 p.m. And our missionaries to South Africa, the Wyatts, will be with us on Sunday, April the 14th. Prayer request. First off, I, I just want to say uh, what a blessing it is to belong to a local body like Brooks Baptist Church where people generally care and pray for each other, have empathy for each other, and uh, it is a blessing. We want to remember uh, Brother Popwell, who is still in the hospital, uh, uh, the Armstrong's daughter, Janet, who is dealing with breast cancer. Uh, Sister Veronica's daughter, recovering from a surgery. Uh, Sister Charlotte Sherrard, whose sister-in-law, Angie Napa Ray, has uh, both her mother and father in the hospital, and a brother has pneumonia as well. Uh, we had a... Uh, Praise from Sister Carolyn for that Danny had successful kidney transplant from a donor from his high school, I believe it was. I also want to hold up Brother uh, Willis' father and uh, keep him in our uh, prayers. Uh, and I had also would like to mention... Uh, answered prayer for my brother Todd that I requested recently. I, I did post a little uh, note, but many of you might not be aware. My brother uh, lives and teaches in Canta, Arizona, 
on an Indian reservation and access to uh, emergency health care is not always easy. He has a history, uh, a long history of complicated and uh, uh, heart surgeries. And so when he has an issue, it's often difficult for him to uh, get to where he needs to be. On this particular occasion, uh, he was airlifted, uh, was supposed to be flown to Flagstaff, Arizona, then Farmington, New Mexico. Then I lost track and finally found him in uh, Prince George, Utah. And as it turns out, what was indicated as a cardiac arrest uh, turned out to be something that they, uh, with drugs, could get back under control, and he has been released and at home Praise now. And I just want to thank everyone uh, for all of your prayers. Let's go to the Lord briefly. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to hold these individuals up. Uh, I want to come to you uh, and... Uh, and just ask that you uh, supply your healing grace, your comfort. Uh, we love you. Uh, we just ask that your will be done in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Men, if you'll come forward to receive the tithes and offerings. Brother David, would you offer a word of prayer for our tithes and offerings? The opportunity to be back here in your house, Lord, to hear your word. Lord, I just want to thank you for all you've done for me. I'd hate to think where I'd be right now wasn't for you. Lord, I want to lift up my brother in Christ. He'll put your loving arms around him, Lord, and his family. Lord, I thank you for this church. Lord, I thank, pray, Lord, you'll keep continuing blessing this church. Thank you for my church family. Lord, I pray for these tithes and offerings. I ask these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. There's a couple of specials I've asked Miss Serena to come back up with Sister Courtney. I don't know how they're going to organize this and play some more of this beautiful harp for us. Y'all love that? That's, that's a blessing, isn't it? Before I ask her to come back up or take your Bible to Psalm 150 real quick, I want to read this to you. This is, this is wonderful. And these are some of those areas that I have to look at and I say, you know what, praise the Lord. If other churches want to use symbols to praise God, I, there's a Bible scripture for it. Amen. And uh, I'm not going to put them down. I personally wouldn't have a drum set in the church here. I mean, I, that just doesn't seem to be my style. But I can go to Texas and Garland back over there and, and, uh, and then that church down there, Brother Bart, and they can have a drum. And, and hey, praise the Lord. They play it well. And I think they do it to the glory of God. It's a blessing. But uh, in Psalm 150, you can't look at a church and say, it ain't no church because they got a drum set in there. Be careful about that. Look what the Bible says. Verse 1, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the auditorium. No, it says in the firmament of his power. Amen. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to the excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and what? Praise him with the tremble, or the, I'm sorry, the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringing instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise what a way to end that book there. Praise ye the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? I thank God we have instruments and people that can play to the glory of God. I've asked Miss Serena, uh, Sister Serena, if she'd be willing. I think she lives in Wisconsin. I said, she, I didn't know this, but she flies up planes. And I said, listen, if we buy your fuel to get back down here for our revival this year, would you come back and play the harp for us again in revival? She said, I think I might be able to work. I'm putting her on the spot here. 
But I, we've offered, and I, I put it out there because I would love to have all kinds of wonderful music for the Lord during revival. Wouldn't you all? And this a blessing. So I've asked you to come back up and play some more specials for us. So here we go. Thank you, sister.
What a blessing. Amen. You won't, you won't find that anywhere else but in the house of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all do me a favor. Take your Bible to the book of Acts tonight, if you will. Um, I want you to pray for me. I know that we have been going through the book of Ecclesiastes, and I don't think we've exhausted that study. And I know we haven't technically finished it, but sometimes the Lord just deals with me about things. And I'm in between two particular subjects. Um, we've been going over somewhat of the book of Hebrews. We've looked at Hebrews chapter 9. And um, we looked a little bit at Hebrews 7, 8, and 9. I showed you all in the order of Melchizedek in the Old Testament. I believe that Melchizedek was a pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ. We see that pretty clearly there in the book of Hebrews. We really moved into Hebrews chapter 9 when we looked at verse 24 through 26 that Jesus Christ hath appeared, so shall he appear. We looked at the fact that he has three different offices, and he does not hold those all simultaneously. Those three offices, he came as a? He is currently right now a? And he's coming back as what? Make no mistake about it, that's the order of how this works in the Word of God. When he comes back again, he's coming back as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. He will be the King of this earth. And you've got Baptists today that will laugh you to scorn when you tell them he's coming back for a 1,000 years to reign on the earth. It doesn't matter what people think about it. Your Bible says it. You believe that. Amen? And I thank the Lord for it. Now, I told you all that there are some um, heretics that say that God is modalistic, which means although Jesus Christ holds three offices one at a time, they say that because that's the case, he can only, as the Godhead, hold one form at a time. So you've got God the, God the Father, God the... And God the, now we understand in John chapter 1 verse 29, John says, I baptized with water. He said, and the one that sent me to baptize, which was God the, he said that when you see the spirit of God descending like a dove in a bodily shape in the book of Mark upon this man, you'll know that he's the lamb of what? John knew that he was the king. What he didn't know, he was the lamb of God. So God says, I'm going to give you the bona fide offer here. I'm going to show you who the lamb of God is. That was Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 29 through 33. Now, when someone says God's modalistic, which means he can only take one form at a time, John chapter 1, verse 29 through 33 squashes that because you've got God the Son, and his, he was 100% man and 100% God, no doubt about it. Jesus Christ on the earth, John is baptizing God the Son. He looks up, and heaven opens up, God the Father speaks, and what's descending at that moment? The Spirit of God upon him. That's God's forms simultaneously in one sweep of Scripture, all three at the same time. God is not bound by taking one form at a time. He is all three if he wants to be, and that's the case. So please don't get those things mixed up. So I've been kind of back and forth on what I want to continue preaching to you all. The book of Hebrews is so rich. I'm thinking uh, I'm in between Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, whether to go to the book of Hebrews or start uh, one of two studies, and I want you to pray about this on Sunday nights. I'm either going to start a study on the local church or I'm going to start a study on the King James Version Bible. Either would be profitable for you. Either would be very profitable for you. I don't know which one I'm going to do just yet. I have not received peace about it, but you, will you pray about that for me? Ask God to give your pastor peace in his heart, what he's going to do. And if we do the King James Version Bible, um, we're going to exhaust that. It'll take, it'll take months. It really will. And there's a reason I'm going to go to that, because I want you all to leave here. and, and be, Something's going to happen. Somebody's going to say, well, you know that King James Version Bible. It ain't legitimate. And I think the question you got to ask is why are Bible seminaries, theological scholars, uh, Bible colleges, and just about everybody else relegating the Word of God and the King James Version Bible to a myth? You can use any of the Bible but the King James Version. Why is that? The first question, church, you got to ask is why is that? Please don't say, well, I just believe what everyone else believes. Don't do that. Don't be a part of that crowd. Don't sign up for that class. And I would, I would need to exhaust it, and I, I would show you first off that there are nine verses primarily um, that I could go to right now that you don't even have to memorize. It's the fastest memory verse in the world's history in the NIV and the ESV and all those others because they're not even in that Bible. You don't, have to, you don't have to worry about trying to memorize. They're just not there. I was speaking to somebody recently, and I said, take your Bible to Matthew 18, 11, and look at it. And they said, well, it's not there. I said, why is that? I'm just, that's the question you've got to ask yourself. I could tell you what Matt, Matthew 18, 11 says. The Son of Man hath come to seek and save that which is lost. Tell me, why would you take that out of the Bible? I was talking to a brother on the phone this afternoon. He said, one of the translations for the King James, some of the works that were being done, somebody was trying to translate it, and they, they accidentally, this happens, they accidentally left out the word uh, not. And it says, thou shalt kill the child. You see how, how the word of God changes when you take a certain word out of it? Now, that was done in ignorance. And the reason, and you've got you to you remember this, 
1611 is when the King James Bible translation was done. By the time you get to 1769, that's the Bible that you all use. Somebody says, well, why is that? I'll tell you why, because in 1611, they didn't have a printing press then. I've read books today from printing presses that have mistakes, lit literary mistakes in them. So they had to correct some of those, okay? It wasn't that there was needed to be amends on the Word of God. Then they went back and made sure that they italicized some of the words that they had seen in the translation to help English readers get context for the reading. Then later on, they went and added verses and chapters. Now, those aren't inspired, but I'm going to tell you something. Those are a blessing to look at. When you look at verses and chapters, it'll, it, will, it, will, it will really invigorate the mind and the spirit when you study your Bible to realize, man, that's amazing to think about. My point is, by the time you get to 1769, they had given some edits to the Word of God, which made it what you have today, and that's a blessing. Because if I told you turn to the book of Jeremiah, I think it's page 30, well, maybe it's 1340 in yours. It's 1345 in mine. We'd be all over the place. So you, you can thank God he's given you some organization. I can say go to John 316. We can all go there and just, I hope so, in a few seconds. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Are you happy for that? And we could go on. I mean, I could show you all the history, all the people that died for the Word of God, and we could just move on. Or we could study a bit of the church. Because you know what I'm finding today in today's society? Everybody wants to bypass the church. Listen to me. I cannot for the life of me understand how Jesus Christ gave himself for the church. It's Ephesians 5.25. That's what he did. He gave himself for the church. He built it, Matthew 16.18. He, he sent it, the empowering body of, of the Spirit of God, in Acts chapter 2. He empowered the church. And then he led the church. Nobody wants to be a part of the church. How, why is that? You ever wondered that? Well, I don't like what the preacher has to say. So what? Most people didn't like what Jesus had to say. When somebody says, well, I've got this ministry, but they're not a part of a church, you're right. That is your ministry. You've bypassed the body of Christ. Why would you do that? I, I, for me, you all, listen, I could preach on this for a while. I can't understand why Jesus Christ would die for something. Say, I love Jesus, but I do not like his church. Here's my analogy. If you told me, Brother Joe, I like you, but I can't stand your wife. You understand what I'm saying, Andrew? Hey, brother. I wouldn't dare look at John Hallett and say, John, I like you, but your wife gets on my nerves. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that to him. My, the, my point in saying, I'm not picking on him. He, he's, he's mature enough to take that. Uh, it, it's just a joke. But my point is, that's what you say when you say, listen, I love Jesus Christ, but I ain't going to church. I don't like her. Okay, go to Ephesians chapter 5 and look in verse 25 real quick. Let's, let, let, we're going to read a few verses here. Just go to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 22. It's one of those mysteries that Paul got. I think I'm leaning towards the church. I don't know yet. It'll be a, good, it'll be a really, really good study. Ephesians chapter 5, are you there? Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Uh, Christ is the bridegroom, correct? He will one day be our husband. We're the wife. Amen. Don't you think that we ought to submit ourselves to Christ? Amen. I think so. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the what? Do you know what you do when you bypass the local body? You've cut off your head. You're lifeless. You're headless. A headless man is a lifeless man. I've never seen... I, I, I hope none of you have, but I've never seen a man walking around with his head chopped off. You've bypassed the local church. Now, I know there are some churches probably that you'd look at and say, I'd gladly bypass this one, but it doesn't matter if you like it. What matters is if God likes it, God liked it enough to die for it. Let's keep reading. I, there's a lot here. He's the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the what? Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in every what? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It's a sad thing when God has to remind husbands to love your wives. You know what I know about your husbands? Some of your wives get on your nerves. I know there are some days you get annoyed and you just don't want to be around. And um, she has to ask you, you still love me? Isn't that a silly thing? Why does a wife have to ask you, do you still love me? I don't want my wife to have to. I want my wife to know that I love her. Amen. I don't do I'm, What I'm saying is I don't do a very good job of it. Something's happening over here. We're going to be up. Listen, look, everybody look at me right here. We're going to be just fine tonight, okay? We're going to be good. We're going to get through this. If this keeps happening, I'm, I'm moving somebody over there, amen? Praise the Lord. It's happening, isn't it? Somebody's getting ready to move. 
But um, you're going to have to get over that. You know what I know about you husbands? You're, you're sometimes you're selfish. You really are. It's true. You think it's all about you, and it's not. And you need to grow up. I, I'm saying that because I need to grow up. I'm not, I, I, listen, you act like I'm looking at you in your home. I have no idea how you treat your wife at your house. Some of you look like you're guilty, though. <laughs> hey, I told you all I want to be honest with you, and I hope that you all want to be honest with me. I was telling Brother Ed and Sister Carolyn LeCar earlier today, if I, the more I read the book of Acts, I get over to the book of Acts in chapter uh, 5, when Ananias and Sapphira had determined in their heart they were going to lie about a piece of land they sold and how much money they got and only take a portion of it. Y'all remember that? You know what I've realized in Acts 5? The Spirit of God picks up on that stuff, and Peter was full of the Holy Ghost then. They came to him, Brother Wade, and they said, here's the, there's the portion we got. Here's what I want to, I want to call, everybody look at me real quick. Let, let this, if you're going to write notes, write this down. Don't lie to someone that has the Holy Ghost. He's more than likely going to tell them you're a liar. Be careful who you lie to. I've had some people lie to me, and I, I've said, I, that's a lie. I know what it is. I've had to call them out on it. Just don't lie to someone who has the Holy Ghost. He just might tell them that's a lie. Are we all right tonight? We're having, hey, I'm, I'm having a great time. I am. I'm having a great time right now. Look here. Husbands, love your wives. I'm going to read it again because it needs to be said. As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know what you need to do sometimes when your wife and you get into an argument instead of ignoring her for two days, go to her and say, honey, you're right. I'm sorry. And don't say it like this, honey, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. I apologize. And don't clench your fist up. Like, I'm really, really sorry. Can we move? Don't do that. You know what Jesus Christ said? She was to blame. I'll take the fault for it. No problem. I, I'll, I'll take it. Go to be sincere because most of the time it is your fault. Women are naturally more mature than some men. It's true. That's what I've heard at least. You got Bible for that anywhere? I'm sure there's some principles in here. Look here. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Don't you love that? By the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without what? So ought men to love their wives. He had to say it again. Notice he didn't tell women to submit again in the same chapter. So, men, what do you do? You love your what? Love your wife. Just love her. Even when she's, I better move on. I'm just teasing. So ought men to love their wives as their own what? He that loveth his wife loveth him what? For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the what? Why does he keep saying that? Why does Paul keep talking? About, why is he talking about a husband and a wife? And why does he keep bringing the church back up into this? Let's read on. For we are members of his what? Of his what? And of his what? Do you believe you're a living, breathing organism in God? You better believe you are. It's what the Bible says you are. 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. You're baptized by the Spirit. You're in the what? You're in the, you're in the church. So the Bible says you become a body. Look what it says here. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one what? This is a great what? But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Look what it says in verse 32. This is a great mystery. He says, but I speak concerning the church and who? Christ. Do you think the church is a big deal? Look at me, church. Everybody look at me and go like this. The church is a big deal. It's a huge deal. I, 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 I don't really have much empathy when someone says, I just don't like the local church. I really don't care if you like it. Christ died for it. He loved it. He died for the church. Don't bypass the local church. Don't you dare do that. Please don't be the kind of person that says, well, I don't have to be attached to a church. And No. And I know, listen, and somebody says, well, you say people need to wait six months before they join. Yeah, we got to try spirits. But I do want them to have a desire to join the local body. You need, and you, you got to understand this. There are things that God has put in order. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. There's nothing orderly with a bunch of Christians walking around without a head. You've got to have a head. 
You've got to be underneath of some authority. Not in a, no, I don't rule as a dictator. I do it not strong-willed, but self-willed. I do it because I love the local body. You need to be sure because I know this. I, know, I can see a difference in Christians who have a local organized body in Christ and those who do not. Do you understand what I'm saying? We could go on and on and on and on about this, but church, please do me a favor. That's why I look over in the last in our covenant. I leave this up here for reasons because that's real old school. The sun, but thank God for sun and rain. Look, here, we moreover engage when we remove. How many of you have read this with me in my office or at some point? How many of you have read this covenant with your pastor? Raise your hand, will you? Most everybody in this room. We moreover engage that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite you know, with some church where we can carry out the spirit of the covenant and the principles of God's what? You know what the first thing that I would do if I moved my membership from local body? I would find another what? You guarantee I would. I'm going to find a good pastor, one that can feed me, one where I can join and be a part of it because I can see a difference between. Let me ask you this. Can you see a difference between some kids who have decent parents and some who do not? Everybody go like this. Sorry, brother. I keep getting in your way here. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to say this. Uh, this is a general statement. This doesn't go for everybody, but I can see a difference in kids that are homeschooled and those that are public schooled. Can you agree with that? I can see a difference in people who shack up and people who get married. Do you agree with that? I see a difference in people who read the Bible and people who do not read their Bible. Do you agree with that? I can see a difference in people who have attached themselves to a local body in Christ and those who have not. Do you agree with that? You better agree with that. It is important. So let's go back to the book of Acts. I'm going to come back to Ephesians later. Let's just go back to the book of Acts. So important. If there is one book that will really help you get an idea of what the first church was, the New Testament church, and what we are, we're far from a New Testament church compared to the book of Acts, okay? I, church, I, I'm, I'm edifying. I'm lifting you up. I think you all do a tremendous job, but here's my point. When it comes to the book of Acts, we in this day and age, I think our former preachers would agree with this, we have fallen really short when it comes to the church of Jerusalem. These people, well, I mean, they were really outdoing us. On, on, in every way. They were meeting every day, everywhere they went, every person they, they talked to. They were talking about Jesus Christ, his resurrection, his death. They were standing up when it was totally unpopular to preach the name of Jesus Christ, pointing fingers in people's faces, being bold, filled with the Spirit of God, having power. They were giving when it hurt. They would give so much it would hurt them. And they would all come together and praise God the Father in heaven. We're missing some of these things. Ephesians chapter 5. Um, Acts, yes, in Acts chapter 5. Thank you, I heard it. I heard you, there, there it is, amen. Let's go to Acts 4. We're going to read a little bit tonight. I'm not going to have you stand. Do do we all just follow along with me? Can we just stay in the Word of God tonight? Acts chapter 4, look at this, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men were about five what? Now remember, The people we're dealing with in Acts chapter 4, verse 1, are the Sadducees. Keep that in mind. Let's read verse 5. And it came to pass in the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. You know what this sounds like? The First Baptist Church deacon meeting. Ready to overthrow the pastor, doesn't it? It does. Look, how do I know that? It's a family meeting. It it says right here in verse 6, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. You know what Jerusalem hated? They hated the preaching that the church members were giving to the people at Jerusalem. Look in verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power and by what name have you done this? Remember hearing that when they asked Jesus, By what authority are you doing this? Remember what Jesus said? I'll ask you a question. If you can can answer me, I'll answer you. John's baptism. Come from God or come from man? Thank you. I appreciate you, Brother Gilbert. One day he said that to me, and I was stumped. I felt like a Sadducee. They couldn't answer him. This is the same questions they were asking. By what power do you do this? They had no idea. The man was God. They missed it. Look what it says in verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't you love that? 
Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people, the elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by which means he is made whole, be it known unto you all. Now, if there's one thing I love about Peter, it's his boldness here. This is the same man that was running when the Romans come to take their, our Savior by, the, by the, the, the night at Garden of Gethsemane to crucify him just a short day later. But there's no, there, I think one preacher said this in a commentary. He said there's not a chance of a relapse here. This is a converted man. And any Brother Willis, this man's converted. He is getting ready to strengthen the brethren. I praise the Lord for that. what it says. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised up from the dead, even by him, that this man stand here before you what? This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the what? Jesus said that too. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is another name under heaven given among men, whereby you must, you must, you must be saved. Hey, he didn't just say, I'm not going to shut up. He said, by the way, this is the only name by which you can be saved. Here's what he's saying. You ain't going to shut me up. I'm not going to stop because this is the only name that you can be saved at. This is a big insult. Peter's bold here. He is. It's like if somebody come in and they had heard me preaching at the GOP meeting last Saturday. They said, we heard you say something about Trump. You're, dead. You're, you're going to jail. I'd say, you can stay back there until I'm done preaching. You can drag me out preaching one or the other. I'm not going without a fight. I will preach until they drag me out of this place. You think about this. I think, I think the Bible said in Acts chapter 3, he preached about four or five hours. And he's dragged out preaching that long. They come in, drag him out, and 5,000 people get saved. Can you imagine if I'm preaching to 5,000 people and they come and take me and, and take me away? I look like a criminal. There was something in his message. He had the power, did he not? Look what it says in verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge in that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. I'll tell you why, because here in, a, here in a, the next chapter it says, or, or this chapter later on, it says this man was at the temple for 40 years in this condition. Don't you love the wisdom of God? He found a man that was 40 years old and made sure these people knew he was born that way, 40 years old. He's leaping and, and, and praising God because of what Jesus Christ had done for him. Now, but when they had commanded them to go aside in verse 15 out of the country, I'm sorry, out of the council they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle has been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot, we cannot deny it. But that is spread that but that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, and they speak and they speak henceforth to no man in this in, in this name, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how that they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Everybody stand to your feet. Let's read a few more verses. Verse 23. And being let go... They went to their own company and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they, are you on verse 24? And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of the servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. By the way, who's speaking here? It's the who? It's the company of the brethren of Peter and John. Look back up in verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own what? Where do you let, hey, where do you go when you're let go of the world? You go to your own company? Do you run for the world or do you run for the church? You better run for the church. Get back to your own company. You're not in good company in the world. John and Peter, the Bible says, they went back to their own company. Who's the company? Their church, their brethren. Look what it says. Verse 25, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain, th vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, Behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants with all what? 
that they may speak thy word. Father, I pray you grant us boldness tonight that we as a church body could understand the power of the church being the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and he being the head and help us with all boldness to speak thy word, not ours, but thine. Father, we love you. We'll give you the praise, the honor, and glory for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to make this as, uh, as uh, edifying as I can tonight. But I want to remind you, let's go back here real quick. So Peter and John have got this great ministry, and Peter's standing up for the second time here back in the book of Acts in chapter 2. preaches a great message, preaches another one in the book of Acts chapter 3. This man is healed. He was 40 years old, and the Bible says that every day they'd pick this man up and they'd lay him at the temple, and he would ask for what? Alms, money. He's asking for money. But thank God that man was there on a particular day, and thank God somebody picked him up every day and brought him to the temple so that he could ask of alms because he couldn't, he couldn't walk. He couldn't work. He's asking for money, but guess what Peter gave him? He didn't give him money, did he? Can you imagine if the guys that carried him every day to the temple called that day and said, listen, I'm not feeling good. I can't take you that day. Imagine the blessing he would have missed out on. I can tell you some of you have missed out on church, and I, I know some of you are sick, and I know some of you live a far distance. You need to understand what I'm saying. There are some times that you miss, not because you're sick and not because you live a distance, just because you didn't want to come, and you miss a blessing. It happens every time. Uh, let me just put it to you this way. I think if we could outline this and kind of look at the scriptures here, number one, in verse number one, remember, remember it says, and under the people and the priests and the captain of the temple that the Sadducees had come upon them. Y'all remember that? Go to Acts 5. Look in verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and they all were with them, which is the sect of the what? The Sadducees. And they were filled with indignation. The Sadducees are mad. Verse 18, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common what? Why are the Sadducees mad? What, thank you, brother. Thank you, Brother Gilbert. Go to Acts 23. <laughs> You'll see in just a second, he's right. Because the, the, he's speaking Bible truth here. Acts 23. Look in verse 6. Look at Paul's appeal to the Pharisees here. Verse 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had said there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was what? Let's read why. Verse 8, for the Sadducees say that there is no what? That's not where it finishes, neither angel nor what? But the Pharisees say there's both. Go back to Acts 5. So the Sadducees are mad because they're preaching the resurrection of the dead in the name of who? Are you all tired tonight? Wake up. Stay awake. I got you for another three hours. You're all right. Verse 17, the Sadducees are upset. They lay their hands on them. Verse 18, put them in prison. Verse 19, but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors. I thought they didn't believe in angels. And isn't it amazing in God's wisdom when the Sadducees got mad, put them in prison? God said, I tell you what, I'm going to send an angel down there to let them go. They don't believe in them anyway. Isn't that amazing? God says, I'm going I'm to send something they don't believe in to let them go. And he does let them go. But first off, you need to understand that if you're going to stand for the Lord in a local church, you're going to be persecuted. Believe me, there are things being said about me in this community that I don't, I'm not even aware of. There are things being said about me in this community that I am aware of. And can I tell you, church, I really don't care. Um, I, I, I say that lightly. I didn't say it didn't hurt me. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I didn't say it didn't hurt. I said I don't care. Because I knew when I signed up to be a part of the Lord's army and to be a child of God, I knew this is what I signed up for. I knew what I was getting myself into. Do you know what I tell every person that decides to join the church here? You need to be ready to go to battle. This is a fight. People are going to say what they, let the community say whatever they want to say about Brooks Baptist Church. Um, it's just going to happen. There's going to be persecution. That's the first P. You're going, to, you're going to suffer persecution. That's what the church here did. I don't think we suffer enough of it. Can I tell you the church was never stronger than it was the day that it was suffering persecution? Do you know what we have now, Brother Keith? we got a church that we're just so apathetic. we got everything that we need. Nobody's paying attention. We're, we're just, this is so regular for us. It's so regular. I imagine if we were being persecuted right now, most of us wouldn't be, wouldn't be tired. I'm not trying to, 
Church, you understand what I'm trying to say right now? Is that we, we've grown apathetic and lazy. It's sad. It really is. But they're being persecuted. Now go back to Acts chapter 4. They're being persecuted. Well, while they're being persecuted, something happens in verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with who? And we know that Peter was filled with the what? So when you're persecuted, you're filled with the power of what? God. Persecution usually leads to being filled with the power of God. Isn't that a blessing? Persecution and power of God. And then they went to prison. Then they come out. Go back to Acts chapter 5, if you will. And they're persecuted. But when the officers in verse 22, Acts 5, 22 came and found them not in the prison. They returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut, we shut with, the, with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple, the chief priests, heard these things, they doubted of, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. <clears throat> then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching people. What do prisoners usually do when they get out of prison? They run. Brother Gilbert, where'd they go? They went back to the temple. You know, if they were smart, they wouldn't have had to look very far to find them. Look what it says in verse 26. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them with violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. The high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring us this man's blood upon us. And they go on and on. But you understand, they faced persecution, they received power, then they went to prison, they came back out, and guess where they went? Go back to Acts chapter 4. I know I'm going back and forth between these two stories. There's some similarities here, though, okay? Look what it says. Verse 23, Acts 4, 23, and being let go, they went into their own what? Company. You know what, how to happen when you, get out, when you go to prison and get out or when you suffer persecution and you come out of it? You ought to go to the people of God. I said it this morning, people ought to know where you are on Sunday and on Wednesday. They ought to know. It ought to just, Brother Kinzer, it ought to just be one of those things. People just know you and your family, you're absent from the house, you're at church on Sunday. They ought to know that about the local church here in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Let all the other churches skip out and stay at home and watch basketball, football, whatever it is they're doing. You church ought to be doing what the New Testament church was doing, finding reason to get in the company, to get around the people of God. It's true. We ought to be around one another. You know why some of us are so dispirited, discouraged? And I love what Brother Keith said. We're driving down to Carthage, Tennessee recently, and out of nowhere, we're just, we, we had a great time, didn't we, Brother Keith? Out of nowhere on the ride down there, he said, he said Pastor, i got to tell you something. He said, I, have, I, have, I am so full of joy. He said, I'm just busting with joy. I have so much happiness. He said, I just can't, I can't contain it. I said, I can't help myself. He said, I was really, two, two years ago, I was not in a good position. He said, but I'm just... I'm so full of joy. It's just a pleasure. I'll tell you, when, when you're persecuted and you're around the power of God, you get around the people of God, you get filled with great joy, don't you, brother? It's true. You know why some Christians are just miserable? Because they never get to the house of God. I know a woman in Danville, Kentucky, that when COVID come around, her and her husband refused to get inside the church building and get elbow to elbow with God's children. They just refused to do it. She put a bullet in her head. Sad. It's tragic. And listen, and don't think you're above that contempt because any of us can fall to that. Safe people can commit suicide. It's true. My point in saying that is this. There's something about being around you all. And there's something about being together in this place together. Isn't it wonderful? I know you all feel this. You all feel the same way that I do? I do. I can get done preaching at 10 o'clock some nights and you all are here till 11. That's, a little, that's an exaggeration. I'm going to back that up. I get done preaching sometimes at 8.30 and you all are here till, I've seen some of you here till 10 o'clock. It's a blessing. Isn't that wonderful to think about? Well, let's see what happens here because you've got power, you've got persecution, you've got power, you've got prison, then you've got your people. You get back around your people, your company, and look what happens in verse 24. This leads to our final one, praise. You all love praising God? I do. Look at verse 24. When they heard that, they lifted up their voice. Who's they? That's the company. Can I tell you this is the church? Is that okay? Can I say that? I know it doesn't say that, but who's their company? We'll go back to Acts chapter 2. 
Look at verse 47. Praising God and having favor. Praising God. There's that, there's that praising again. All the people coming together. They're praising God, verse 47, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be what? Hmm. I know it says company, but we can say church, can't we? Is your company the church? Amen. Praise the Lord. That's what the Bible says here. Look here. And they, the church, lift up their voice. Look what it says here. Unto God with one what? One accord. And said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. This is, listen, this church is beginning to praise God in one accord. Listen to the words of their praise. Look what it says. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine of vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Uh, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness that we may speak of thy word. Boldness is what got them in trouble in the first place. And here they are asking for more of it. Right, Verse 30, by stretching forth thine hand to heal. And that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child who? And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Here comes some more power. Where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the what? And they spake the word of God with what? You get praise, which will give you a boldness of presentation of the Word of God. Do you know why Brother Keith can put a, a podium out in his front yard and preach to the Dollar General across the street? It's because he's got joy and he's filled with boldness, brother. Isn't he, isn't he Brother Bart? He is. You're so bold, Brother Keith. To me, I, you're one of the boldest men I know. I mean that. He'll get up and he'll, he'll, he'll look at you in the face and talk to anybody about Jesus Christ. And I think, man, he is so bold. He told me, he said, I'm planning on going to the street corner. How many days a week did you say you're planning on doing that? Four days a week just to go and preach the gospel to people passing by. I tell you what, brother, I want to go with you. I don't know if I can go four days a week, but I want to go with you. And I want to go, I want to go stand out and give the gospel to folks. My point is, when you look at the book of Acts, you're, you're seeing some things that are happening to that church that we just don't experience today. When's the last time we all came together and sang one accord and the building began to shake? Last, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And everybody, everybody, look what it says. Look what it says. When Jesus, and when, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled. Now, now get it. The place isn't the church. When you look at Brooks Baptist Church, please don't say that's the church. When y'all pass by, say that's my church building. The place where they were. It's the people that were the company, not the place. I've been into a lot of places that say Baptist, and I don't feel like I'm in amongst a company. You understand what I'm saying? Be careful of saying that. This is the church building. Look what it says. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the Word of God with boldness. You know what I think will happen when we finally get a hold of some of these things? And I'm, I'm thinking about preaching a series on the church, and I, I really believe the Lord's going to bless it. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let me show you this, and we're going to close tonight. Ephesians chapter 2. Do you all know Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, but we are his. Thank you, amen. Do you know where the context of that verse is? We're going to read starting in verse number 1. We'll give you some context, Acts 2. And you hath he quickened. Who's that? The saved. What does quickened mean? To be made alive. Okay? Remember when the, young, uh, the, uh, the prodigal son returned, he said, This is my son in whom was dead, but now is alive. Was he a zombie? No, he was spiritually dead, but now he's alive unto me. So you're quickened, spiritually alive, who were dead in trespasses and what? You were dead, Christ made you alive. You believe that? Verse 2, wherein in times past, that's, that is, is that future tense or past tense? It's past tense. In past times, ye walked according to the course of this world do you all still walk to the course of this, of this world you better not can i tell you all something um i hope when you go out in public people say man that's one of those members of brooks baptist church i i hope people can say that about us or when do you come by people go oh there they come get ready hey 
I'm at, what, do you, what do you think people think about you? I'm asking you. You used to walk according to this world, according to the prince and the power of the what? John 8, 44, ye are, your, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, ye will do. Look what it says as we finish here. The spirit, that's not a capital S. That's not talking about God. The spirit that now worketh in the children of who? That's an evil spirit, is it not? Okay, look at verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. Anyone that's come from darkness to light, you all had your conversation in times past in the darkness of this world. Look here. In the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as what? But God. You all see that? This is where everything changes. Amen. I think a mess, I, I want to preach a message on but God. Praise the Lord. Look what it says. Who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. You believe God loved you when you were dead in sins? That's what the Bible says. He loved you when you were dead in sins. To bring you out of it, look what it says. Hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in who? Can I tell you all something, church? You know what the Bible just said here? It says that Christ has resurrected you, he's quickened you spiritually, and guess what? You, who are in Christ, are seated in heavenly places right now. Why? Because Christ is your head. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Your position is in heaven right now with the Lord, seated at the right hand of the Father. Your condition down here is you're still in this world in the flesh. But because you're born again, guess what? The Bible says you're up there. Look what it says in verse 7. And in the ages to come that he might show his, the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now it says, for by grace through faith are you saved. Doesn't that just make a lot? A, doesn't that just really invigorate you? Isn't that a blessing to know? There's a song that Brother Travis Alltop sings, and it's, uh, I, I, Sister Patty, I think you've listened to it before. So I said, waiting on my brand new body. Have y'all heard that song? Waiting on my body to be. He says, I'm sitting up there in heavenly places. He says, I'm, I know I'm there at the right hand of the Father. He says, right now all I'm doing is just waiting on my body to be. But right now it's where I'm at. You know what you ought to live like? You ought to live like God is sitting to your left hand. That's what you ought to live like. You know what the church in Acts was living like? Like Jesus Christ died yesterday, was resurrected today, he was coming back tomorrow, and they were seated in high places with God the Father. That's what they lived like. And can I tell you, I know God's not requiring you to sell everything you have and come and bring um, you, your prices of your land so that we can all meet our own needs. Listen, I think the, in my, this is my personal opinion. I believe they genuinely thought the Lord Jesus Christ was getting ready to come back. What need do you have of lands and stuff? They sold everything and brought, and they're just making sure everybody, everybody's taken care of until Jesus Christ comes back. That's what they believed. But here's my point. They gave until it hurt. They loved well. I'm going to ask you all a question. How many of you have, have gone and visit Brother Robbie in the hospital? Do you think Peter would have done it? Do you think John would have done it? I believe they would have. Do you think the church would have done it? I believe the church would have done it. Can I tell you it's a blessing when I get to go visit some of our widows or when I get to go and visit some members that haven't been here for a while or I call them? And listen, I don't, ever, I don't usually bring this up, but I'm just asking you, church, do you think the first church would have done those things? Everybody go like this. Yes. We can pray for them. That's wonderful. But you can do a little bit more than just pray for them. You understand what I'm saying? So, church, I'm just trying to help you to get a grip on a couple of things. If we really want to follow the New Testament on what a church ought to be in Christ, the book of Acts is a great example of that, especially the first eight chapters. It's marvelous. Persecution, power, prison, company or people, and praise. Isn't that wonderful? Do you all like coming to the house of God and praising God for what he's done? I certainly do. And I thank God that he's our head. Don't you, aren't you thankful that you have a head in, in heaven? I am. Where is your authority? It's right here. This is your final authority. You know where your authority is sitting right now? In heavenly places with God the Father. Why would somebody not want an authority? I can't understand that. But God's given us the local church. I'm not going to bypass it. I, wanna, I want to see it strengthened. And church, I believe this. I believe God can bring some young families, men and women in here, and I believe God can help to train these young men and women up, and we can send them out to pastor other churches as well. And we could duplicate that process. Do you think Brooks could send out missionaries? I believe we can. I really, I, I really do. I think God would have us to do that. Somebody says, well, we're going to lose our best church members. Well, then you fill the spot when they go. 
I hope our best people do leave because the world needs our best people. I don't want to be selfish about church members. I want to see things grow in Christ. This right here, you all, is so special. I don't want to take this for granted. And I think a series on the church would greatly help. I really do. I thank God for a local body. I thank God for a man that came to Elizabethtown, Kentucky and started to work here by the authority of another church. 1986, he devoted his entire life to working in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Come down here with not a penny in his pocket, literally. Just, I mean, we're talking about a man that there was a day that he had no food at all. And his wife said, I've cooked everything I have in the kitchen. There's, I have nothing left. And he said, get all the kids together. We're going to pray. Gathered all the kids together, and he began to pray. And what he did not know is that God was getting ready to answer his prayers. There's a man with a couple of baskets full of food was getting ready to knock on the door. And he heard Brother Heron there praying and begging God to take care of his needs. Finished the prayer, and I'm sure it was a long one, wasn't it, Brother Bart? And there was a knock on the door. And they opened the door up, and there was food right there. Aren't you thankful that God had sent a man like that? I've got a portrait of him in my office. I thank God for that man, don't you? Do you thank God that Jesus Christ sent that man? Do you thank God that Jesus Christ is working right now through this church right now? I don't want to take you all for granted. I don't. I don't want to take a man like Brother Keith and Sister Marsha for granted. I don't want to take an individual like Brother Ed and Sister Carolyn for granted. I don't want to take Billy Bob for granted. I don't want to take David Carroll for granted. I don't want to take Brother and Sister Heron for granted. I don't want to take the Kellers for granted. I don't want to take you for granted, Brother Andrew. I don't want to take the Trombleys for granted. I want to love you all until it hurts me. I mean, I really, really do. I want to go above and beyond to love you all. And I think that's what the church was doing so we can all come together in praise and the power and the omniscience of God. Isn't that a blessing? How important is the church? I'll tell you this, Christ died for it. Why would you bypass it? Please don't, please don't be that church. And please don't make people think that they can just do that. I'm not saying you just, you take a Bible and go, you're an idiot and slap over the head. I'm just saying, wait, wait, think about it. Wait, wait, wait a second. Think about it. It's precious. It's, it, it, the church means everything to me because it was worth the body and blood of my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This make sense? And this a blessing? I don't I want you to pray. I don't know exactly where God's gonna have me, but church, I want you to realize let's not take each other for granted, please. Let's love one another. Amen. Everybody get up from your seats if we can. Come on over here and grab a hand. Come on over here and grab a hand real quick. Come on, Sister Adeline. And grab a hand. I'll take your hand. Brother Tom, I want you to find somebody in this circle and just tell them you love them, brother. Tell them what you appreciate about them. Can you do that? Find somebody and say, listen, I love you. This is what I appreciate about you. Sister Patty just loves the church. Amen. I know she does. Praise the Lord. Oh, bless her. Brother Bradley Kinzer, I love you, brother. I really do. I thank God for you and your family. I know you driving here, having all those kids, it's a privilege to see you all grow. I thank, I thank God for you and your wife and what you do. I really do. Brother Willis, find somebody, tell them you love them, tell them what you love about them, brother. Amen. Amen. Brother Keith, find somebody, tell them you love them, tell them what you love about them. Sister Ashlyn Trombley, find somebody and tell them what, that you love them and tell them what you love about them. <laughs> hey, why is it that we can't tell each other we love? I, I, I'm, I'm not going to let the homosexuals take my love. I can look at a man and say, I love you, brother. I mean that. I don't, want them to, I don't want the sodomites to take that from me. And I don't want the world to say that they're the ones that love. The church ought to be the ones that loves. I don't let the world out love us. Amen? Brother Wade, find somebody you love and tell them what you love about them. Amen. Amen. Hey, brother, we all know it. Amen. Praise the Lord. He said, I also love my wife, too. He, 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 hey, I said, find one person. He said, I love you, but I also love my wife. Amen. He wasn't going to let that one go. We know you love him, don't you, sister? Praise the Lord. Amen. You all, I, lo I, I love you, buddy. I love the church. I thank God for her. And I thank God for him 
being with us. Brother uh, Willis, we close our service out in a word of prayer.